Welcome everybody to our, I guess this is our third virtual open house here for the Suncoast Center for Fine Scale Modeling. Um, as you know, the, uh, we were not able to open in March, April, or May. We hope we're going to be able to open for a, uh, a live open house in September. Uh, so we started doing these virtual open houses in lieu of the, uh, the live events that we typically do on the third Saturday of every month. Um, and, but we got pretty good feedback and people seem to like them. So we're going to continue to do the virtual open houses over the summer. Many of you know, if you've been here before or follow us on our site, that we are, we are closed for the summer, typically June, July, and August. And uh, that's where we do a lot of work at the center and uh, retool the place, getting ready for the fall. But we're going to continue the virtual open houses because people seem to like them. And uh, it's a good opportunity to keep you updated on projects and, and have a good time thinking about how you can increase your modeling skills going forward and sharing ideas back and forth. And so where we're headed today, um, we have, this is what the agenda looks like today. We're gonna have a walking video tour of our displays. We actually uh, shot a walking video, um, I guess it was probably uh, about six weeks ago. And we finally figured out, we believe, how to get video to stream pretty smoothly on the Zoom platform. I think they've probably done some enhancements. And so we'll be doing a walking video tour. You'll see the video and we'll add some narration along the way. For those of you that have not been here or not have seen the, uh, the center in the past, it gives you a, a good update and a feel for the kinds of things we have here. <clears throat> so that's item number one, the headlines of each, behind each one. And then we have three mini clinics, so to speak. First one is I'm building a loading dock in HO, pretty simple project, fun to do, but uh, greatly enhances the look of, of a building. So we'll be uh, covering that. And then the next would be a scratch building a car float in O scale. You see that we have that on the Lakeshore Industrial Railway. And uh, Frank will talk about how he put that together and built it and uh, the process involved. Um, and then also on there, we'll, Rich will be talking about uh, bookshelf layouts and uh, some display things. He, in several, I guess it was two uh, open houses ago on the virtual, he talked about making the uh, display cases. But today is going to be showing you the end product where he actually has the displays with the scenery and the models and what it looks like um, in, in a finished product. And then, of course, we'll be answering your questions. And so if you look on your screen, you see there is a place for you for Q&A to put your questions in there. And so add those questions along the way and we'll keep track and we'll try to answer those questions, certainly as we get uh, toward the end of our presentation here. So. Um, if you've not been here before, you don't know what it looks like. This is a picture of our building. We're at Odessa. We're just about 45 minutes north of Tampa. And so uh, we've got about 7,500 square feet. We're in a light industrial area. And the building uh, essentially has been remodeled on the inside for all of our displays. Uh, so if you've been here, you know what it looks like. Here's another shot on the side. We've got our Shea on the side, working our little repairs there. And that was made for us by a company out of the, on the West Coast. And so this is what the building looks like at House of the Sundance Central modular uh, layout, which is in the center, plus the other four operating uh, train layouts and all the military model displays. And so why are we not doing live open houses? This is why, because this is what it typically looks like during an open house. We generally have a pretty good crowd. As you can see, it's, uh, it's a bit of a challenge to maintain social distancing. So this is what it looks like as people work through the open house or open the third Saturday of every month, September through May, and uh, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And so people come, they get a chance to talk to us about the displays. We also do live clinics when we have the open houses. Here's a picture of one of our clinics. We have a modeling stage uh, with a video screen. We're able to, uh, to show the process and the work. And so we're continuing the clinics, obviously virtually here over the course of the summer. And so the first item is our walking tour, uh, the video for the Center for Fine Scale Modeling. And so I'm going to bring up the video here. Um, and so we will give you some explanation of what you're looking at as, you, as we go through the video. This will give you a good overview of what the center looks like. So here we go. So what you're looking at here, this is our our latest addition, this is the newest layout that we built, the Lakeshore Industrial Area. This is a switching layout, an operating switching layout, not an operating scheme, it's no scale, 148. And uh, so it's two rail, this is a both 100 rail. And uh, 
a scratch-built uh, ON30 layout. I guess we're on to the U-boat dry dock now. We are, yes. Okay. Can you hear me better at this point? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is a work in progress. This is a 132nd, 135th scale uh, dry dock scene with a German U-boat board scene. And like work in progress, every week something else is being added to it. Uh, major structures have all been pretty much built. It's not been detailed. There are buildings, most of which are all completed. And now it's about adding details and doing basically small vignettes within the diorama. Uh, lots more details to be added. So every time, in fact, today, there's actually more items on here than there are in the video because every time I, during the week, I do work on it and uh, start adding more. And, and Hey, somehow you muted yourself. Yeah, somehow. I'm trying to figure All that right. out. All right. Now. There you go. All right. I don't know what happened. I didn't touch anything. But um, it's going to be, uh, it'll probably take me another year to, to pretty much finish it up. That's an, it's a seaplane. It's called an Arado, um, which will be a scene within the water area. This is obviously at the dry dock, the wet side of the dry dock. And then you see more details from those different angles. Now I think we're basically scanning the, this is the 
workbench that we use for when we do clinics. It's got a lot of extra items on it at this point. And we clean it up when we have a live open house. And uh, there, there are a number of displays in here that are military displays. They're very large. They're one six scale. For people who don't know, that's basically G.I. Joe doll size. They're very big models. It's a personal interest of mine. And we, I do several eras in here. There's, this is, happens to be a World War II Sherman 105 a Sherman tank with crew. And then we have a little section dedicated to Vietnam. Uh, often in our builds here, we use real pictures to depict what the model is. So you can see the photo in the background, the real photo taken, and then of course the model as it's been built to represent that. This one was actually built in Italy by a friend of mine named Luca Montiovesi, who probably is one of the best one six scale figure modelers I've ever met. He's constantly adding additional work here. Another one six scale Vietnam scene. A lot of the items in here are taken from real photographs. We, uh, so a lot of the, the little details are taken from photographs. This is an O scale machine shop by Brian Nolan, who passed away several years ago. Good friend of mine and a good friend of the centers. And one of the, he did some fantastic O scale model building. This is his machine shop. Family donated it for display here. He passed away, and I've been pleased to. It's beautiful work. Now you're going to see several 1 6 scale. Um, additional World War II models depicting different air times in World War II throughout the war. This is obviously a medical tent. It is not a MASH unit. This is a World War II medical tent. This is before MASH, but a lot of people confuse it for MASH units. Lots of figures, lots of details. It also includes the only, I believe it might be the only one six scale female figure that we have in the place, a nurse. This is a very large, the whole diorama is eight feet long, um, of a Higgins landing craft, model of a Higgins landing craft with crew and details. This was uh, actually built in the Philippines. This is what I call a collaboration. The unit was built in the Philippines. Uh, the details are added by me and the figures are added by Luca out of Italy. So I have lots of collaborations here where Different parts of my people. This was done by Luca from Italy, and this depicts a scene from the movie Saving Private Ryan, Omaha Beach. And if you look closely at one of the figures, it's Tom Hanks. And we'll end this with a Jeep. Uh, several years ago, Frank Palmer mentioned that we would be cool to do a boxcar, um, 40 and 8, I think they called it. Whoops. What happened there? I don't know. Who ended? Hang on. I was working on the other screen, so I may have inadvertently ended. Let me go back to it. All right. So we were. Keep going. Yeah, right there, Jim. Right there. You're about right there. Back up a little okay. bit. A little bit more. Yeah, we're there. there. Okay. All right. So we're, we're, we'll be there in a second. Anyways, uh, once again, this is the uh, Omaha Beach scene. Pretty graphic. Uh, a Jeep with an airborne unit, two figures there. And then we're over to the uh, 40 and 8, which was um, Frank Palmer saw a photo. I assumed it was a photo of a museum that showed prisoners of war, a bomber crew being load, unloaded or loaded onto a boxcar and so it was the basis for the diorama which is once again very large i think the whole diorama is about 10 feet long and now we're over to the other armored unit that's on here this was once again taken from a photo which is panning up to an end of uh the battle of the bulge uh 1944 and Almost all these models are detailed completely, so they're in the round, so you can actually spin them around. So there's the inside of the structure, and 
different items we do. And then we're over to the Sundance, which I'm going to let Jim talk about. Now, Frank, why don't you give us a tour here? Just give us a little narration of what we're seeing. Okay, well, we're coming up uh, to one of the end modules and uh, there's Tim, say hi, Tim. Uh, we're coming around to the church. Oh, there's a Jim Hope's gas station. And alongside the gas station is the church with a little graveyard. And next to the church, oh, what do we have here? A pool hall and a brothel right next to the church. Well, that's not very good, but that's the way it goes. And then we've got the little kids playing and the little kid, little boys are looking up at the naked ladies and the little girls giving them all kinds of grief for looking up at the naked ladies. And this is a little uh, slum area that it's hard to see, but there's little kids playing baseball in the backyard. And uh, as we pan along, this, now we're coming up to a tribute to Brian Nolan for the uh, Wagon Works. And uh, naturally it's out of business because Brian died several years ago and uh, it's just been left uh, to rot away. And here comes Tim's unweathered Shea locomotive coming by. Days, Tim will actually. Uh, as the smoke clears, we come around the corner. We've got the general store. And if Richard had the sound going, you'd hear the banjo playing. Now we're coming up to the logging camp uh, with Supervisor's House and then a few of the others. And if we've just paused the video, uh, okay, never mind. Okay, we'll come back up to the logging camp. What did you want to see there, Frank? I was going to show Dale. Oh, let me see if we can get this. To... Just go back like a minute. I mean, a couple seconds. Oh, well. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're not a team yet, but we're working on it. The lighter's a little sensitive there, Frank. Yeah. Yeah, I see Dale, like Dale I be coming before, up in a moment. Coming around and... Here, come back to the supervisor's house, and here comes oh. Dale. Pause the video. There he is. Yeah. Dale was one of our members and did a lot of work on the Sundance and really promoted it. And uh, he'll always be remembered. He died about two or three years ago. And we had a figure created in memory of Dale. One of Dale's biggest things, he loved to take photographs. So it's a little blurry, but we've got him here with one of those old uh, glass negative cameras. Okay, we continue on. Now we're back up to the logging camp. And we've got uh, the log sawmill up there, the uh, logging uh, buildings here. The filer's shack and right. And now we come up uh, and we're coming around to looking in at the log pond and then the crossover between both sides of the layout. Now they've got the blacksmith shop and he's pounding away on a horseshoe, I believe it is. Now we're coming up to the steam donkey, the large motorized steam donkey. There's a tunnel going through the mountain and we've got a little uh, hand car shack here done by Richard and this is Richard's trestle. It's a curved trestle. It's about 15 feet long, 28 inches high. And it's when we go from uh, one site to another, this trestle is fully disassemblable. And it has to be put back together each time. It takes us about 15 to 18 hours to put this entire layout back together. Every time we move it to a different location. Coming around the corner, here's got my little box cabs, scratch built box cabs, the scratch built cars, and pile driver. There's a coaling shed, Richard's scratch built caterpillar tractor. Now we're coming along to the yard. loading dock and there's the only shiny car in the entire layout. That's Mrs. Weaver's car. She's at the station. Now we're coming up to the uh, feed and grain uh, location. Here's a standard gauge box car. So it's a little bigger than most. 
Now we've got the, some locomotives parked in the yard. Got a, now yeah, we're coming around the corner. That's Richard's K-28. All brass and stainless steel locomotive. Very nice, right accurate, right down to the rivet. Now we're coming up to the engine house. Yeah, now we're into the machine shop. This is one of Dave's things. And Dave took about a year to build this engine house and machine shop. It is immaculate inside. You cannot believe the detail. It, well, we just passed up a water tank that shouldn't have been there, but anyway. Now we're coming up the side of the machine shop and some debris parked along the track uh, waiting repair. There's the crew. There's the track crew getting ready to go out on a job. Looking in the machine shop and the engine house. Uh, engine house needs a new roof. Sorry, folks. There's the turntable. It's an Armstrong turntable, as you can see, with a gallows type turntable. Oh, we're steaming up here. By the way, this is all 120.3, which is F and the free scale, right? Well, will you be taking on water? No, you're not going to be taking on water. No, not today. We do have an operating water tank with full cool sound, and uh, we didn't have it on this particular video. Well, we've got a slight oil spill here. Here's an oil tank for oil fed locomotives, a wood pile for wood fed locomotives, and the coaling display. Oh, gee, that's a rusted out tank car for sure. Most of our buildings are made to look like if you kick them, they would fall down. So that's the kind of modeling we like to do. Here's my trestle. It's also 15 feet long and 28. Well, it was 28 inches high. Now we come off the John Addison's SN3 layout. Here's his trestle, which is about four feet long. The very detailed SN3 layout. By the way, he's redoing his whole background, hand painting that. We'll probably do it yeah. on that next month. This is the this first is called Hacksaw project. Ridge, this area right here. Hacksaw Ridge. Okay. <laughs> All right, now here's his little water scene on the end. A couple of docks, a lot of fishing boats. Oh, and we have a beach boat over here that ran aground and with the bottom's falling out of it. How do you know that, Frank? Because I built it that way <laughs> and donated it to John. I think that this layout is probably almost as old as the Sundance Central. It's probably 15, 16 years ago this was built, right? Actually, it's quite a bit, uh, quite a few years older because this was the layout that I saw in Rhode Island at the narrow gauge convention that inspired me to get together and get with you guys to build the Sundance Central. Well, you I thought this was one of the most unique. 94? I don't know what year it was. No, I don't remember what year, but uh, I thought this is one of the, oh my gosh, there's me. There's my wife's uh, little bar up top. Pauline's place. She'll be serving as uh, soon as, uh, well, in an hour and a half. Well, the bar will be open at noon. Now okay. we got a South Shields. <laughs> All right, so there you go. There's an overview. If, you, if you've been to the center before, it's a, a nice little trip down memory lane. Um, if you've not been to the center before, oh, you're then you're tuning in. Welcome back to where. Tony Northeastern. Yeah, we got a little background it noise. It seems there, like a long time ago. Uh, uh, and so uh, you get a sense for what anyway, the center looks like. So let's on. move on to our next topic here. I'd just like to say a very big thank you to everyone who commented. Okay, who's got the audio video. going here among our um, presenters? It was quite exceptional receiving I'm all those comments. That has been the biggest amount of comments. I believe he's from jolly old England. And uh, I do okay. appreciate every single comment, and I do try and reply to every single one of them. 
Right, so... Okay, not sure how to... Videos, we concentrate on the station. I think it might be you, Jim. As we keep... Might be me. I am running low on... You started running a video right when the uh, original one stopped. There you okay. Go. Built 27. I'm going to have to drop out of this for and, a moment. Uh, That's good catch there, Keith. All right. It's always fun operating a live show. All right, so we'll go back to where we were. It's our blooper reel. There we go. All right, so on to the first um, mini clinic here. This is on making a loading dock. It's a fun project, a pretty simple project that can make your models look a whole lot better because a lot of the loading docks that uh, come with kits or other buildings that you're building are at the right size. They're gonna have the look you're, that uh, you want. So this was basically something I built for my HO switching layout that I have here at home and I was using the two inch foam board that's extruded polystyrene. You don't want the beaded stuff. Dow makes it, sometimes it's pink. We have some stuff up there that is gray. Sometimes you see it in blue, but this is what it looked like. You'll probably recognize this building. This is a Walther's kit uh, in HO. But the thing is when you get the kit, it's a, it's a low relief building. It's only probably, it looks to me like about an inch and three quarters deep. And so when you put it against the backdrop, sometimes the, uh, the loading dock that they provide isn't the right depth that you need in order to get to your track properly. So I decided to build a new one using the foam and that's what it looks like. So how'd we do it? Basically, this is what the foam looks like, the two inches. I just cut it into uh, to pieces. And so I'd simply measure the, uh, the length and the width and the height that I needed. And stuff is easy to cut. You can cut it with a hacksaw. We often cut it with, we have a, uh, um, various saws, power saws that we use up in the center, but it's easy to cut this stuff. It's easy to work with it. And so it's cut the length there. The other thing that uh, you'll see is um, our resident architect, Richard here, uh, assured me that it told me that it was the 10 foot spacing for the expansion joints. So I got out my 187th ruler and uh, did 10 foot uh, lines on there. So we have the expansion joints on the, the two pieces there. The other thing I wanted is I, wanted a little bit of relief and some texture on the surface so it wasn't entirely smooth. And so I was trying to figure out the best way to put some texture on there. What I ended up doing was using my fingernail. So those little ridges you see, those are various dents I made in the foam, but it's easy to do that with some light pressure with the fingernail. So this is what it looked like in the raw form. And so then to give it more of a masonry feel and a little bit of continuity, Going forward, I did a skim coat, if you will, with, uh, with joint compound. It's easy to do. It's a great material to use. And so there's another picture of it there. You can see what it looks like after the, uh, the joint compound dried. You still have all the lines you need there for the expansion joints, and you still have some relief there for some of the texture, but it gives you a feel, brings it together. It takes the shininess off of the, uh, the foam that makes it feel and look a little bit more like a masonry product. Um, and so then we get into painting it. And so what I did from a paint standpoint, I wanted something with like aged concrete. One of the things that always drives me nuts when I see uh, models put together is some representing concrete in pure gray. And it only looks like that when it's brand new. So some of you I'm sure are familiar with the paint color aged concrete. Basically it's mostly gray with a touch of a little bit of tan or brown in order to bring out that aged look. So I painted both of those pieces there with the, uh, it was basically just acrylic paint with the mix, the custom mix I did. It was probably seven eighths gray and maybe one eighth of the, um, of the tan color to come up with an aged look. The other thing you see on that, that foreground piece there, I, you see I started to do some, uh, some weathering with um, basically hydrox, okay, alcohol and India ink. And so I was showing you the contrast between what the base coat looked like after I painted it and when I put on the initial coat there of the India ink. You see the mix in the jar behind me. That's a mix that actually Frank gave me. I've been using for a while and supplemented it. And so that's what it looks like when it's wet. Uh, when it dried, of course, it dried a little bit lighter. And so this is what the product ends up looking like. Uh, there's really two things that are happening here. Three things. You got, you got the base coat of the aged concrete and then the uh, wash with the... Uh, India ink and uh, the alcohol, the hydrox. And so that leaves all of the texture that you see there. And then I wanted something that looked just a little bit dark to my eye. 
And also I wanted to give it a little bit of a powdered look like you would see on a concrete dock. So I just used some powders on it, a little bit of gray, a little bit of brown mixed together and brushed those on with you know a light brush, like a makeup brush. And so that's the, uh, the, the effect that you get. There's a close up. So you see it still has plenty enough texture. The expansion joints are still there and uh, the ridges and so on. You got a little bit of that India ink that sits down in some of the crevices and uh, makes for a nice texture. And so that's the look you get. There's a close up of the um, of one of the pieces that went in front of the building you're looking at there. And again, you know, you still got a little bit of texture on there that gives you that uh, concrete look. In HO, it might be if you if you <laughs> could measure those pieces and scale those little bumps, they might be just a little bit high. But when you display it, um, you need a little bit of this sort of like stage makeup to give you a sense because people are looking at it from five or six feet away. You have to be able to see something other than a solid color. And so that's what it looked like on the bench after I uh, basically just put the, the finished product up against the building when I still had it on the bench. Um, and so again, this is what it looked like in, in installation and uh, the little blend again with the scenery, but makes for a pretty convincing dock. It's a pretty easy project to do. It's fun and allows you to be creative. And it's wonderful when you see that texture and some of those ridges and expansion joints popping out. Um, here's that other piece that I made the uh, smaller, flatter piece I actually did under uh, this building. Uh, this is a scratch built building. You'd see that uh, we don't have a loading dock. This is really the whole foundation for the building. Now I haven't mounted that building on the loading dock. You see that gap I see between the building and, and the, uh, the concrete base. I'm gonna be filling that in. I just haven't had a chance to do it yet, but there's a lot that you can do with this. Obviously, you know, this scene has a little bit less texture than this scene because this is an older, uh, rougher looking building by design and weathered. So there's a lot that you can do with this. Um, then, you know, here's another example of that same process. This again is the extruded foam. This was O scale buildings you saw on the Lakeshore Industrial Railway. And so this was a scratch built that I did. And I used basically that's a block of foam, that gray foam, that same gray foam that we saw in the HO example. Uh, this was the base for the loading dock yeah, for that building uh, in O scale. So there's a lot that you can do. Love working with foam. We do a lot with foam um, at uh, the center. And this is one of the examples for building a loading dock. Okay, so Frank, talk to us about the car float. This is no scale. Are you there, Frank? Hello, Frank. <laughs> All right, anybody from the center still on the line? Do we have a mute issue going on here? Can you hear me, Jim? Yeah, I can hear you. Why can't we hear Frank is the question. Doesn't show on my end that he's muted. Shows his microphone is live. Rich, are you there? All right, Frank, are you there now? Keith, are you there? I'm here. So why has everybody else disappeared? Oh, well, we're here at the center. Okay, I don't know what happened with Frank, what the deal is. So I guess we're going to- Okay. Frank says that you have him muted. I don't though. No, he's not muted. Hey, Frank, just mute yourself and then unmute. Okay, you got me now? Yeah, there know. you go. All right, Frank. Okay. Well, that was a slight glitch. Wow. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, this, don't push the blue button. I didn't touch anything. This <laughs> must be I'm just over. kidding, Frank. <laughs> I'm just sitting back, cooling my heels. Uh, okay, this is the car float. We needed uh, a little action on the Lakeshore Industrial layout, so 
besides the switch and we got we wanted to give it a little water scene so this uh, tugboat was uh, purchased by Dave and uh, I built it it's a Dumas kit it's an O scale version it can be uh, it had a full hull on it and I cut the bottom off so that we could use it here it's it can be uh, motorized and sailed on a lake now the car float was uh, used to like a terminus so that we could have a, a point of operation to and from. So this is the back end of the car float. Yeah, by the way, for folks, just a little bit of background on the Lakeshore Industrial Railway. It is uh, loosely modeled after the Cleveland Lakeshore and Lake Erie. And so there were car floats that were operating on the Lakeshore. And so this is a part of what we're doing, you know, if you're shipping something from the uh, the Cleveland Lake Shore off to uh, one of the destinations by water, you would be using this car float. Okay, next slide. All right, this is how it all began. Once again, I'm using the gray foam, which is a little over two inches thick. And the reason I did that was because the entire layout is made out of the gray foam, which is two inches thick. So now I would have a level surface to go to uh, from the layout to the car float. So I just cut it out of foam and then uh, covered it with uh, Centra plastic, which is eighth inch thick PVC plastic. It's very easy to cut and uh, works out really nice. And I attached it to the uh, foam with Gorilla Glue, the water activated Gorilla Glue. And I've scratched out some lines here to try and get an idea of where the track would go on the float. All right, now here I've got the entire float covered in the PVC plastic and I'm laying out some box cars. You can see I got 40s and 50s just to see how I might be able to get them on there. Now here we got the, you have to have a bridge going from the, the land side to the float side. So I'm making this out of uh, PVC ties. They're actually PVC board that I cut up into ties. Now I've soldered all the track on there using a fast tracks template. Uh, only here, it's the uh, a Y template. It's a number three Y, I believe it is. And I've soldered that together using uh, code 100 rail. And on the left side, you can see how it looks before it's painted up. And on the right, it's uh, painted and slightly weathered. And here's the bottom side of the layout showing the uh, structure to, uh, you know, stiffen the bridge up. It's all been soldered together with brass. All right, now here's the electric motor system, which is a little kit that I had from, I believe it was Ozark Miniatures. And then I purchased some life rings and then with brass wire, I made the life ring uh, holders. And on the right side, we've got the, uh, the mechanism to lift and uh, lower the ramp or the bridge. Here's the Y coming from the bridge onto the float. And I've got the life rings in place with the uh, running lights on the barge. And on the right side, which I'm showing the tail end of the stern end of the barge with the running light and the life rings. What did you use to make the life rings, Frank? No, I bought those from uh, uh, one of those ship model companies. Okay. All right, what about the cleats and stuff like that on the boat? Okay, well, they were, that's white metal uh, cleats. And then I used, I soldered uh, brass triangles to the end of the track so the cars won't run off the end. Those are just uh, rail stops. Got it. Okay. Now here's a side view of the barge. And it's tied up at our uh, local dock. Yeah, so here we're switching, actually, two 50 foot cars on there. Um, you can, uh, yeah, I uh, redesign. When I put the uh, number three Y switch on, it allowed us to get some extra long. You could get 250s and then 240s on the other side. Right. <clears throat> Here's a top view and it's on the left, on the right, you can see the uh, the bridge mechanism, the raising and lowering mechanism. It's uh, quite a lot more detailed now. It's, uh, I believe it's low tide. Oh no, we don't have tides on the Lake Erie, do we? <laughs> we do not have tides. 
Now, sometimes it's, you it's, get water building up with a northeast wind across the lake from Canada, but you know, no tides. Very true. So we got the tires on the side of the barge, and then I've uh, got the pilings there so we can tie up the tug and the barge. The barge just slides in between those uh, little uh, dolphin pilings. Well, here's another end view looking back at the completed project and uh, right down the Lakeshore Industrial Railroad layout. Yeah, so the good news about this, I know this creates a really interesting looking model, but it also creates some interesting operational uh, details and moves to make when you're you're doing the uh, switch list. And so there, this, every one of the switch lists that we have includes picking up cars from the car float and delivering cars to the car float. And so there's a little bit of thinking that has to go into it as to which car goes first how it goes into the float, how you're going to get it cleared, put the other cars in. You really can't run the locomotive onto the car float. That certainly won't work because it's far too heavy. So it adds a bit of interesting uh, operational capability into this too that uh, keeps the thing engaged. And the nice thing about the car float is, I mean, we have factory designation uh, stops and stuff like that, but just very common. Yeah, I mean, you just get bored with that. And the car float added a little more interesting designation. Yeah, the other thing a car float allows you to do is put rolling stock on your layout that you do not necessarily have an industry call for. So you might have a particular type of car that isn't necessary for the industries you have displayed on your main layout. But when you put it on the car float in the destination, you know, there's an industry somewhere else that needs that particular kind of car. So it's a way for you to justify additional rolling stock on your layout that is not necessarily supported by the needs of your industry that you're switching. And also this car, this uh, diorama depicts something on uh, Cleveland uh, in, uh, on Lake Erie. And on the other side of the Lake Erie, we have Canada. So we have a box car here representative of Canada. We do, it's heading home. <laughs> That's right. Okay, all right. Thanks, Frank. So, Rich, um, I know they've been working on your project here on the bookshelf display diorama. So, uh, if you can give us a little bit of background on how this whole thing came together. Uh, Rich, I think you're muted, Rich. Yeah, unmute yourself there, Rich. You're not muted on this end. Is that better? There That's you go. Better. Okay. Uh, so back in April, we had our virtual open house. I spoke about doing acrylic cases, display cases for your models. <clears throat> and I showed you how we put those together, how we cut the uh, acrylic plastic, uh, how it's bound together with the, uh, the glue that you need for the acrylic and uh, had all the cases done. So the next thing to do was build the bases for them. Uh, the photos you see here, they're already finished, but to just give you a run through. Uh, I chose red wood, red oak, excuse me, for the base. You can pick other hardwoods if you want walnut. Uh, then we cut them to size. And then we had a, uh, a router in the uh, shop area at our center and we put a decorative edge around each one of the bases. Uh, and after they were completed, you sand them down and stain them. And then I put a light coat, overcoat, polyurethane, got a satin finish. I didn't want a real high gloss. So that kind of finished the, the base. Then you got into doing a sub base. The sub base is what you're actually going to attach your scenery and road uh, work ties and rails. Uh, so I chose some poplar that we cut down. It's about three eighths inch thick. And we use that for the sub base. I painted it black. I mean, you wanna paint the front and the back side black. Uh, the reason for it after you attach it to your oak base, you can be working with water and white glue so you don't want this to uh, ripple on you and, and 
turn up. So that's why you want to seal the backside also. So after you've uh, done the painting on that, uh, you attach a sub base to the oak using uh, yellow glue. Yellow glue is waterproof. And the reason you're using that is, as I said later, when you start doing the scenery and other work, you're going to be using water and white glue to attach that stuff so you don't want to have the sub base come apart from the oak base. Uh, what I used, uh, this is all on one to 20.3 models. So what I came across next was doing the ties. I cut those out of cedar. And Jim, if you want to go up to the next slide, uh, you'll see that after I cut them, I used a wood burner and added a little bit more graining to it. Then I stained the ties with a mixture of brown shoe polish and alcohol. And after that dried, I did a little bit of dry brushing on top of it using a uh, color. It's called linen. It's in the uh, uh, water-based paint material. And uh, then you glue down the ties Again, you're using yellow glue because you don't want it to come apart on the sub base when you start adding the other scenery with, with the glue. I was fortunate enough to have one of our garden railroad buddies still had some crushed granite left over when he had his outdoor garden railroad. So I was able to obtain enough of that to use the gravel down for our, our tracks and stuff. But what you do is put all your gravel roadbed down. And uh, once you got it in place, you want to hit it with wet water. Wet water is water where you add a couple of drops of detergent to it. And it actually breaks up the uh, surface tension of the water and it allows it to flow continuous across rather than, than puddling up. So sprayed the whole area with wet water, then came back and a mixture of white glue and water and applied that. And that held the gravel rope bed in place. And after it dried, then I took that and I used our same rail that we have on Sundance. It's code 250 aluminum. It was sprayed with a darker rust color for the sides. Again, when I attached it to the ties, I also used uh, tie plates. And we bought them through, I think, Lagos Creek at the time. We had those stained. And I applied them to the uh, ties with a gauge. And the thing is, with the spikes being stainless steel and hand spiking, uh, the spikes were about an inch long. So you had to kind of pre-drill the holes in the tie plate down through it because the spikes going down in that oak, it's kind of hard to, to, to do that. But if you pre-drill it, it goes in pretty good. Once I've got that done, I kind of touch up the tie plates and the spikes with a dark umber paint to kind of take away any of the shine that was uh, taken off the metal at the time. Uh, then the scenery, I went in to Scenery Express. They have different things that you can use. What I picked up was the one that had a combination of weeds and a little taller grass. Even though that Scenery Express is made for the smaller, you know, one third scale or uh, O scale, I think maybe is the largest they have. It works out pretty good, even at the one to 20 scale. And if you go to the next slide, Jim. I was gonna say, Rich, some of that, uh, those clumps of weeds looks like some of the Martin Welberg stuff, if I recall. The yeah, yes, yes it is. It's, it's his line on Scenic Express. Yeah, They're it's nice it. stuff. We've used it at all scales. I've used some of it in HO, we use it in O scale, it works here too. Yes. So now you see the, uh, skeleton log car that I built some years ago 
it was probably the first uh, one in the twenties kit that I built. It was through Hartford. Uh, so it's finished, it's sitting on now the base. And the next slide will show you with the acrylic cover on top of it. And this one I'll present to my grandson, put it up on his shelf in the bedroom, uh, just to remember grandpa, what he did and what he was, did for a hobby and modeling. Next slide is to show you some of the smaller uh, bases I did for some of the smaller models. This is a four wheel crane car, it's all scratch built. Uh, again, the same uh, aspect of using the wood base, the oak, the sub base, again, applying the ties and the rail and the seam, the same as what I explained before. The car itself, uh, some of the stuff that I got from Ozark Miniatures was the little crane, uh, also the journals for the wheel sets. And what I did for the journals, I inserted some brass tubing for the wheel sets to go in because the journals were made of white metal. And we run these cars on the layout, so you didn't want to wear out the uh, white metal. You can click on the next one there, Jim. It'll show the uh, same thing, detail. Again, I use the same thing from Scenic Express. Uh, shows you what happens there. And then the next slide shows you the car in the case uh, completed. And I think the next slide is, yeah, that's the car in the case. And those are the finished models. I did five of those uh, cases for the grandkids and the great grandkids to give it to them. So I think it turned out very nice. You can do it for some of the models you build, you know, just to keep the dust and other things off them, keep them pristine. It's really not hard to do. I explained how I built the plastic cases and now I explain to you how I did the wood bases. So uh, good luck with doing that. All right, cool. Thanks, Rich. Yeah, this is, if you want to know more even about making the, the cases um, on our YouTube channel, which is uh, the Center for Fine Scale Modeling, we have uh, our first virtual webinar up there recording. And so Rich describes the process of making those cases. So if you want to know more about making the display cases, go to the YouTube channel and you can see um, that video and see his original presentation on that. Okay. Um, speaking of which, the YouTube channel, um, Suncoast Center for Fine Scale Modeling, if you just go to YouTube and you put that in the search bar, Suncoast Center for Fine Scale Modeling, our YouTube channel will come up. There's a bunch of things that we've posted, some other things that we follow that you see on there as well. Uh, the video that we looked at, the walking tour of the Suncoast Center, uh, that's up there. Uh, are the last two uh, live webinars that we did, uh, virtual open houses, they're up there too. And some other things we posted, how switching works. There's some cool stuff there and some links to some other things. There's actually, there's a guy that comes in here. He's got a, a channel called Need for Life, N-E-E-D with the number four and then life. And, you know, he shoots our stuff late in the afternoon when the uh, where the crowd starts to thin out during open houses, he's posted the video. He's He's got almost a million views on the one video of the Sundance Central that he's posted. So there's a lot of stuff out there. If you want to see more and go to our YouTube channel, it's all there. Uh, the other thing is, is, you know, with our website, if, if we're many of you are on our mailing list, which is how you found out about this uh, virtual open house. If you're not, go to our site and get on the mailing list. We'll keep you updated about things like this that we're doing and when the place is open, directions, events, there's an online gift shop if you wanna pick up pictures or cups or whatever you might wanna do, postcards, all that stuff is there. But you know, check our site from time to time because that's where we, uh, we update things. We also have a, a Facebook page. So um, feel free to visit that. We try to update with that with some degree of regularity. Um, and so that's what's happening at this point. At the Suncoast Center for Fine Scale Modeling, 
had a good crowd today and it looks like everybody stayed to the end. We appreciate that. Uh, I was looking at the questions a couple times and we ended up uh, having things move we didn't want to move because I was checking the questions. It looks like we have answered the questions that uh, you had during the, uh, the program itself. There's nothing remaining out there. But if you do have a question about anything that we're doing, you can see here on the website where it says contact, you can just click right there and uh, that'll take you to our email address and you can send us any questions or comments that you have. We'd be happy to respond to you. So we hope everybody has a great weekend, a great Father's Day weekend, and that uh, you continue having fun in your own modeling work. And maybe you picked up a few ideas here that would be helpful. And so stay tuned, get on our mailing list, and we'll let you know what we're doing in July. On that note, I think we're finished. Thanks, everybody.